So of all the discoveries that were made in the excavations of Babylon, there is one that I believe uh, stands out in its significance. When I got to Babylon in my exploration, I went to this particular place that I was intrigued with. And it wasn't because of what it looked like, it didn't look like much, but it was because of the discovery that was made there, and really because of the profoundness of the way this discovery fits together with the Bible. Here at the Pergamon Museum in Berlin, is uh, on display the Ishtar Gate. This is one of the amazing finds in biblical archeology. span So in 1899, the German archeologist Robert Koldewe began excavating in Babylon. And uh, there had been some previous excavations, but uh, by far Koldewe's excavations were the most extensive. He excavated from 1899 to 1917. It was the outbreak of World War I that brought his excavations to an end. If there was an award that was given out for the history of archaeology for the director that moved the most dirt in one dig, uh, it would have to be, I would think, given to Koldewe because the amount of earth that he moved is just mind-boggling. He hired over 200 workers that worked daily for over 15 years. So one of the main areas that he focused on first in his excavations was the processional way, which was the main street of Babylon that passed through the Ishtar Gate on its way to the Temple of Marduk. In one of the early photographs, we see the railroad that he built and the railroad carts that he used to move dirt. And uh, in this photograph, protruding from the ground is the top of one of the towers of the Ishtar Gate. And so in places, he had to dig down with his team uh, 80 feet to get to the paving stones in the processional way. So the Ishtar Gate um, is in two sections. One you see in Babylon, this is a lower section. It's about preserved to about 40 feet in height. And uh, it's original, it was built by Nebuchadnezzar as well. And then the upper part was this highly decorated part of the gate, which Koldewe found in fragments. These fragments of which Koldewe estimated there were about 37,000 fragments that he collected were put in crates and shipped back to Berlin and then very painstakingly uh, reconstructed like a giant jigsaw puzzle in the Berlin Museum uh, so that people could come in and see this display and in fact it's displayed there to this day. After I visited Babylon I took a trip to Berlin to see the Ishtar Gate and some of the other finds that Koldewe made during his excavations. Here at the Pergamon Museum in Berlin what we have on either side here is preserved originally 60 lions on each side. So that's 120 lions like this for the processional way. It was just elaborately decorated. This is the Ishtar Gate that uh, Koldewe brought back here to Berlin to display in this museum. The dragon of Babylon that's on the Ishtar Gate, which is associated with Marduk, who is the king of the Babylonian gods, as well as the bull, which is associated with Marduk's son, Nabu. So next to the Ishtar Gate, Koldewe excavated another building. And this building had very unique construction. It had 14 rooms with arched ceilings uh, made of stone. And this matched some of the descriptions of the famous Hanging Gardens of Babylon. So Koldewe was convinced that this building was the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, and so he excavated it very extensively, including the ancient staircase that went down to the entrance of the building. And it was in association with this staircase that he found a cache of almost 300 cuneiform tablets. Okay, this, uh, this is a modern staircase but it comes down where the ancient staircase came down. Koldewe was excavating here when he found what I consider to be the most important discovery in Babylon that connects to the Bible. He found a, a stash of cuneiform tablets here, almost 300 tablets. 
So what these tablets ended up being is basically ancient receipts. So it was the palace administration that was, uh, that was giving out rations, mainly to prisoners. And so it was a list of what they had given, oil or grain, and whom they had given it to. Because this is the nature of these tablets, they're often referred to generally as the ration tablets. Mentioned on multiple tablets is a very significant name and title. So as an example, uh, the translation from one of these tablets says, 10 selah of oil to Yakin, king of Judah, two and a half selah of oil to the sons of the king of Judah. And basically, Yakin is a condensed version of the name Yehoiakin or Jehoiakin. Okay, so this is very significant because Yakin, king of Judah, in the ration tablets, is Jehoiachin, king of Judah, in the Bible. So we're in Berlin at the museum, and this is one of what are called the ration tablets that Robert Koldeve found in 1903. Uh, Jehoiachin, king of Judah, is found in the Bible, and Jehoiachin, king of Judah, is found on this ration tablet on display here in Berlin. The label underneath this ration tablet uh, is in German, but it translates ration list, mentioning Jehoiachin of Judah from the Babylonian captivity, and then it gives an approximate date of about 580 BC. So what is, what's the big deal? What's the significance of this find? Well, to understand that, we need to go to the Bible. And really the place to start is 2 Samuel chapter 7. And here God makes David promises which are known uh, as the Davidic covenant. And the promise that he makes him in verse 16 says, Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. The house of David, that is the royal dynasty, his lineage of sons, uh, are going to never end. They're going to last forever. Now, why is it so important that the house of David lasts and endures the ravages of history? Because the promise is, is that the Messiah would come from the house of David. We see this in Isaiah 16, 5, which says, In love a throne will be established, in faithfulness a man will sit on it, one from the house of David. And so, logically, if God keeps his promise to David, then the house of David has to last at least from the time of David until the Messiah comes from it and then sits on his throne and rules over his kingdom forever and ever. So I want to give a quick example of how a house comes to an end, how a royal dynasty becomes extinct. And so we'll look at the house of Basha. Basha was one of the kings that ruled the northern kingdom of Israel. In 1 Kings 16, the Lord says, I am about to wipe out Basha and his house. Zimri came in, struck him down, and killed him. Then he succeeded him as king. He killed off Basha's whole family. He did not spare a single male. To end a house, stage one, you kill the king and replace him. Stage two, you kill all of his male descendants. And we see this happen again and again in the Bible and then of course also in history. And so this is typical. And so what the Lord is saying to David is this isn't going to happen to you. Your house, your kingdom, your throne, will never end. It's going to last forever. Uh, the biggest threat to this promise was the Babylonian conquest. So the last king to rule from Jerusalem over Judah from the house of David is Zedekiah. And he is the king when the Babylonian conquest conquers Jerusalem and burns the city and the temple. And so we read about his fate in 2 Kings chapter 25 where it says, King Zedekiah was captured. They killed the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes. Then they put out his eyes, bound him with bronze shackles, and took him to Babylon. Okay, so that doesn't sound good. That sounds like what happened to the house of Basha. So is this the end of the house of David? Has God broken his promise to David? There has to be another explanation. Of course, this event we just read happens in 2 Kings chapter 25. If we go back one chapter to chapter 24, we read of another event that happened previously. In 2 Kings chapter 24, it says, Jehoiachin was 18 years old when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem three months. 
At that time, the officers of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, advanced on Jerusalem and laid siege to it. Jehoiachin, king of Judah, surrendered to him. Nebuchadnezzar took Jehoiachin captive to Babylon. He made Matanya, Jehoiachin's uncle, king in his place and changed his name to Zedekiah. So based on this account, who is the legitimate king of Judah? Is it the king who inherited his throne and uh, who is still alive, though he's captive in Babylon? Or is it the king that the enemy put in place? Uh, obviously, from the Judean perspective, the legitimate king is Jehoiachin. And we see in the ration tablets, because they call Yaakin the king of Judah, we see that they also see Jehoiachin as the legitimate king. When you're watching a football game, sometimes they fake the ball, and sometimes even the cameraman follows the fake, and so you think that this person has the ball, but then they're tackled and you realize they don't have the ball, and this person going around the end for a touchdown has the ball. That's kind of what happens when you're reading through 2 Kings chapters 24 and 25, is there's this fake. You think that Zedekiah has the promise of the house of David, but then he gets uh, destroyed, his sons get killed, and you realize he doesn't hold the promise. Uh, Jehoiachin is the one in Babylon who holds the promise of the house of David. And this is why the book of Kings ends the way that it does. If we think of First and Second Kings as one book, it ends with these two sentences. So Jehoiachin put aside his prison clothes and for the rest of his life ate regularly at the king's table. Day by day, the king gave Jehoiachin a regular allowance as long as he lived. So why does the book of Kings end this way? Well, because it ends with hope. Uh, what is it saying? What is it showing? It's showing that the house of David is still alive. God's promise has not been broken to David. The Messiah is still coming from the house of David. So here we have archeological evidence of the house of David surviving the Babylonian destruction of Jerusalem. So we have God promise that his house will last forever. Then we have the threat of the Babylonian conquest. And then we have the Bible saying, this is how the house of David survives that. Uh, it survives through Jehoiachin being taken to Babylon as an exile. And uh, then we have confirmation of that that's found in the excavations of Babylon by Koldave. We have again another match between the archaeological evidence and the biblical text. So also on this tablet, um, it's talking about the oil that's being given to Yaakin, that's Jehoiachin, the king of Judah, it says, and also to his sons. Now we know from the Bible that one of the sons of Jehoiachin is Sheltiel, and one of his sons is Zerubbabel. So Zerubbabel is the grandson of Jehoiachin on this tablet who is the one who leads the exiles from Babylon back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. And so these sons of the king of Judah are the preservation of the lineage of, of David that lasts until Zerubbabel and beyond all the way until the New Testament when the angel announces to Mary in Luke chapter 1 where he says, you will conceive and give birth to a son and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. This is the fulfillment of the promise to David that his house would last forever. So one of the main reasons that I went all the way to Babylon to see Babylon was to see the place where the ration tablets were discovered. So we have here archeological evidence that uh, the house of David survives the Babylonian destruction, the Babylonian exile. And then afterwards, to go all the way to Berlin, I wanted to see the ration tablets themselves on display. And so we have here uh, one from the house of David that is mentioned both in the Bible and outside of the Bible on these ration tablets that were discovered in 1903 in Babylon. And in my opinion, this is the most important discovery that Koldave made in his long and extensive dig at Babylon. This is evidence, hard evidence. Archaeologically speaking, 
uh, this discovery is like the house of David coming up from the earth. It's like the resurrection of the house of David. It supports the faithfulness of God, that God was faithful to David and he kept his promise that his house would endure forever until the Messiah would come from it. God also keeps his promise to all those who will put their trust in him. He promises eternal life and we can rest assured that he will keep that promise. To learn more about evidence supporting the Bible, you can order a copy of my book, Where God Came Down, The Archaeological Evidence. Just click the link in the description below this video. If you like this video, please give it a like. And I also recommend that you watch these other two videos about the Tomb of David, part one and part two. And thank you for watching.